We're continuing our studies in the book of Amos and seeking practical uh, applications therefrom. We're going to look at a few verses in chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. I trust that you've tried to get in a little time to read the book of Amos so as to be rather familiar with the language and the style of writing and points of emphasis. Amos chapter 5. Beginning in verse 21. God speaking through the prophet. Amos 5, 21. I hate, I despise, your feast days and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings I will not accept them neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts take thou away from me the noise of thy songs for I will not hear the melody of thy vials but let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years O house of Israel but ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Kion your images the star of your God which ye made to yourselves. Therefore will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. When I came into the ministry, there was a prevalent need in New England amongst the uh, Christian churches to get away from salvation by works. There was a great need for the emphasis on salvation by faith. So much had entered into the, the thinking of the various denominations over a period of years going back to just a few generations perhaps after our independence that emphasized uh, diligence, honesty, fair play, golden rule, and all of those things which have their place and need emphasis. But there was very little understanding as we began to discover that salvation was not by diligence, good deeds, kindness, and observing the golden rule, but salvation was by faith received, by the grace of God. And therefore it was necessary to give great emphasis to justification by faith, that man was not saved by his works, or his character, or his church attendance, or his diligence in observing religious occasions, or showing fair play in his daily dealings. No, man could be saved only by receiving salvation as a free gift from God. Now, it wasn't clearly understood even some of those who were Christians and to whom I ministered and whom I had every reason to believe from what they said that they had personally trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. There was still the need to emphasize, to teach and to preach justification by faith. Justification by faith, the great... uh, a Protestant slogan going back to the days of Martin Luther 
and others. Justification by faith means that the sinner, whoever he may be, high or low, rich or poor, the sinner who trusts no longer in himself or any part of himself, but throws himself upon the mercy of God is declared just before a holy God. This was not clearly understood and it needed emphasis again and again. Man is saved not by his character but by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary who made propitiation not only for our sins but for the sins of the whole world. And a person was saved, a person could be saved, and a person was kept saved by God's grace, God's goodness. Salvation was a gift. Salvation is a gift. Salvation will always be a gift. You can reject the gift. You can refuse the gift, but it is there. We were happy to see growth. We saw people coming to know the Lord. Little by little we began to find that there were other ministers coming into the New England area who were also preaching justification by faith and folks were saved and gained real assurance that it was by the grace of God alone. And they began to see more clearly the difference between real apostolic Christianity and that which had been inherited from the Roman Catholic religion. For, as you know, the Roman Church has always taught that salvation is through Jesus Christ's crucifixion on the cross of Calvary through his shed blood the Roman Catholic Church has always taught that. But it has added another word. And that is the conjunction and saying in effect and often publicly that salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ and and good works, good deeds, good intentions, repentance, adherence to church law, etc. And some of that had entered into the thinking of the Protestant constituency in New England and it was necessary to give emphasis to the fact that salvation was through Jesus Christ alone why we pray and why we plead and as you see your soul's deep need why not come to Jesus now is the day of salvation and if today you hear his voice harden not your hearts as time went on we began to notice something else and that was that the pendulum began to swing the other way. For any great doctrine that is not emphasized soon becomes very dim in the minds of people. And after a while, because of lack of emphasis, many of us were responsible, people began to lose whatever true concept they had of God and they forgot who God really is and so there came a period of carelessness and even lewdness as people thought oh this is great this is fine we're saved by faith and it doesn't make very much difference now what we do and this has been prevalent not only in New England, 
but right across our country from the Pacific to the Atlantic and from the northern border to the southern that we have a generation now that does not know who God really is. And so we need to preach this and teach this to the Christian people for they're not going to be effective witnesses before a world that has no concept of God that is anywhere near accurate. The pendulum has a way of swinging from one emphasis to another and in between there can be a great loss of spiritual growth and understanding. All of the Bible is inspired of God and so we're not neglecting the Old Testament. We find that it is extremely important as it is part of the revelation that begins in Genesis and continues through the last book in the Bible, some call the Apocalypse or the book of Revelation. And the great theme of the Bible is the disclosure and the revelation of who God really is. One of the cardinal sins of Israel in the old days was the sin of forgetting God. They forgot who he really is. And we are told in the 50th Psalm that when a people forget who God is, they create a God in their own image. Thou thoughtest that I was such an one as thyself. And because of an ignoble concept of God, their lives begin to evidence all of the wickedness and the evil of which human nature is capable. Our theme today is to emphasize again an attribute and a characteristic of God that does not receive adequate attention. And that is the God who hates. In dealing with young people and young men and young women who have grown up in a, in a Christian environment for 15, 20, 25 years, we discover that they do not know the God of the Bible as he's revealed. A God who hates all they've heard all their lives is that God loves, God cares. Now here in the passage that we have just read and is open to you now in the fifth chapter of Amos, God says, I hate, I despise. I hate, I despise. Now, Anyone at all familiar with the Old Testament thus far? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Prophets, the Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, up to this time would know that the sovereign God hates and there are some things that he hates. Remember that when we speak of God we're speaking of that which is infinite. And when we speak of a character of God or a characteristic of God we speak of that which is infinite. Just as surely as we are not to underestimate the love of God we must not underestimate the hatred of God. You know, it was the knowledge of the wrath of God that enabled the Methodist circuit writers 
in the old days of developing and pioneering in the West to bring so many people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because they preached hell they preached hell fire they preached the wrath of God as they preached the gospel of salvation by grace through faith as a result people feared they were afraid to continue to live in sin they were certainly afraid to die in sin you and I need today to have in our own minds as well as in our vocabulary and in our witnessing the knowledge and the expression that there is a God who hates he had earlier repeated his hatred toward idolatry and false gods now here in this passage in Amos 5 21 through the following verses he shows his hatred toward imitation this he does in condemning their apostate traditional religion supposed to be the worship of him the true God notice the listing here of feast days solemn assemblies the burning of incense meat offerings peace offerings and religious music pretending to be joyous before God now this people had become apostate and it begins with imitation we might call it hypocrisy sham but it's imitation going through the motions saying the right things and so forth and then comes innovation bringing in other things developing uh, other things as part of that religious system and finally in the last stage of apostasy there is true antagonism toward the very truth of God imitation the feast days the solemn assemblies the burning of incense meat offerings peace offerings and the music and God says I hate it I hate it you know from your earlier study that Israel was a pull away nation they had separated they had seceded from the kingdom of David his son Solomon had brought that nation to great prestige because of his wisdom because of his skill but he had also allowed other things to come in which brought God's disfavor and to have a great and prosperous nation there's apt to be a lot of taxation and as a result when Solomon died the people wanted some relief they didn't want the stern measures to which they had been subjected for so long and in the days of his son ten tribes pulled away they seceded they very nearly had a civil war but God allowed this to happen and these ten tribes are those particularly the ones to whom Amos is speaking in the name of the Lord and they set up a an imitation religion of that which was to go on in Jerusalem only and so they had their feast days their solemn assemblies imitation imitation they burned the incense they had a priesthood they had meat offerings 
burnt offerings, peace offerings, all imitations of the real thing that was going on in Jerusalem. God says, I hate it all. I hate it all. And maybe they had improved on the music. We do not know. But music usually goes along with religion, and they had it. And God said, I can't stand it. Then the Lord chides this people for their persistent adhering to the gods and the superstition of the pagan nations. Note verse 26. Ye have borne the tabernacle of Moloch and so forth. Now let's be sure that we know who is speaking here. At least 16 times in this book we have the expression thus saith the Lord. And that repetition ought to come forth as a thunderbolt to this people who certainly need a awakening. It is the Almighty who is speaking. And he emphasizes it twice. And I think of the one in four, chapter 4, verse 13, where he calls himself, himself the Lord God of armies, the Lord God of of hosts in our translation and he reminds them of his mighty works we've studied that together how he took them out of Egypt and he performed all these wonders and miracles that only a great God uh, could do and he shows that he's a God with volition and intent and purpose 33 times in this book God says, I will. I will, I will, I will. And just as I have performed in the past, so I will perform in the future. Now then, what is it that God hates? What are the lessons that we can draw from this? throughout the Bible now and I'm thinking of course of the Christian community and those who claim to be followers of Christ or believers in Christ one is of course idolatry God hates it God hates it think of the expression in, that Paul writes to the Corinthians neither be idolaters and flee from idolatry. And the Apostle John writes, keep yourselves from idols. It is surprising how few professing Christians recognize idolatry in their communion or in their own lives. They have limited their thinking to somebody carving an image or something like that and they haven't gone beyond it they do not really understand that anything anything that takes my affection that should be to Jesus Christ is idolatry and God says I hate it you know, it ought to really stir us up to realize that there may well be in our own lives and in our own homes and our own uh, Christian practices things that God hates. Then, he hates pretension, imitation, imitating the prescribed rights in the case of Israel the psalmist wrote about this and I'm going to quote from Psalm 78 they did flatter him with their mouth and they lied unto him with their tongues for their heart was not right with him they said the right things 
at the right time, but the heart was not in it. They were only imitating. They were only parrots that had been taught to say certain things. You remember in the New Testament the severe judgment that came upon a man and his wife in the book of Acts chapter 5 Ananias and Sapphira and it is said that Ananias lied before the Holy Spirit he pretended he imitated he pretended to be doing what all the others were doing God hates pretension God hates this form of imitation which we can well describe as actual hypocrisy and in writing to the young pastor Timothy the apostle Paul writes of the last days of the departure from the faith describing some as having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof they have the form but they do not have the reality and God says I hate it isn't he the same God today of course he is of course he is and if you become well accustomed to knowing God through the reading in the Old Testament then you understand these simple short brief phrases in the New Testament God hasn't changed he's the same the same God who hates idolatry hates imitation pretension but thirdly we had something else here did we not mixture mixture as much as God hates idolatry and as much as he hates pretension he hates mixture the blending of true and false the apostle Paul wrote these words in 1 Corinthians 10 20 but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice they sacrifice to demons not to God and I would not that ye should have fellowship with demons God hates mixture and in the next verse ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the tables of demons well this of course was going on in Israel in the days of of Amos not only did they have idolatry not only did they have an imitation of the true worship in Jerusalem but they had a mixture and a blending of the whole thing and God hates mixture contemporary religion that is Christian professing to be Christian has an ignoble concept of God and that God can hate or that God hates anybody is foreign to the thinking today you may be here today maybe you're getting interested maybe you're beginning to see things in the Bible you hadn't seen before I hope so and probably that is the reason that some of you have come again and again and God bless you I, I'm, I'm encouraged it's thrilling to find people coming out even in, in Clement weather and saying why this is this is helpful I'm beginning to understand the Bible that I haven't understood before that's that that's encouraging but I hope that we go farther than just having better knowledge and better understanding I hope we can go a little bit farther where God wants to bring us and that is to the place of application application is there that in my own life which is really idolatry that I put before God 
Is there that in my church going, my speaking or my singing or my serving on committees or anything like that, that's simply just an imitation of the real thing? And is there in my life, in my thinking, a mixture where actually, on the one hand, the demons are being worshipped, and on the other hand, the living God. The Holy Spirit is able to make the application. We only mention it. But it is extremely important that as you and I go into the area of application, we determine and determine it definitely whether or no we're really, really saved and belong to the Lord. Remember that God hates sin. He hates it. And as we said a moment ago, his attributes are infinite. We don't know what hate is in its full sense. We do not know what love is in its full sense as it is in God. And just think of it. You may be having in your life that which God hates with all of the intensity of his holy being. How awful, how terrible. But if you're here today and you have not come to Jesus Christ and called upon him to save you, remember, you're living under the wrath of God. You're living under the wrath of God. His wrath is upon you now. His attitude is that of hatred now upon your sin and you're postponing this. While we pray and while we plead and as you see your soul's deep need, why not come to Jesus now? For we would not be fulfilling our obligation if we only had an intellectual concept of an Old Testament book. We, would have to, we have to come to the place where we realize God is revealing more of himself or re-emphasizing what he's already revealed about himself. But we have to go the third step as well. And that is to make the personal application. If I am a Christian, I don't want anything in my life that God hates. Amen? If I'm not a Christian, if I'm not saved, I better get with it right away quick I don't want to continue to live under the wrath of God or to die that way let us learn a lesson from Amos that the God who is eternal is a God who also hates let us pray Father, as we come to separate from one another for a little while, we pray that thy word will take root in us and that we might recognize what we are in thy sight, what we need before thee, and how thou canst supply it. Father, I pray for any here today who are living in sin and disobedience and who have been assuming that somehow you don't mind, you don't care, cause them to understand that is, it is sin that separates man from God. Now dismiss us with thy blessing. Bring souls to thyself and believers to victory, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.